Hello, good afternoon. Today our guest is Mark Koyama. Hello, Mark. How are you doing? How are you doing, Ibsen? Ah, good. How are you? I'm great, Mark. I am a big fan fan of your research and today we're going to start by talking about your paper geopolitics and asia's litigate divergence state building in china and japan after 1850 but before we do so mark i must mention state capacity you have done extensive research on the relationship between state capacity and economic growth and your findings have been replicated by other economists so mark is the state capacity literature posing a challenge to libertarians? I'm a libertarian. Yeah, I think it's uh, it, it poses a challenge, but it's not necessarily um, incompatible with uh, appreciation of, of liberty and freedom. Um, there's a blog post you may have heard of by Tyler Cowan, my colleague, where he refers to state capacity libertarianism as a as kind of position where these two uh, these two things uh, uh, come together and uh, uh, kind of are, are consistent. But it is a challenge because if you think about libertarianism, say human beings will flourish where the state is either minimal or entirely absent, um, then state capacity is a challenge to that because it's making the point. Okay, I'm sorry about my dog. Uh, it's making the point that um, you need basic public goods to be provided. And again, these public goods could be provided by um, private institutions as well as public ones, potentially. But you need some basic institutions to be provided for markets to flourish. So things like courts or the rule of law. And as I said, libertarian theorists like Robert Nozick or my rough or others have thought about the ways these could be provided privately. But historically, these are generally provided by the state. And if they are going to be provided by the state, you want them to be provided as effectively as possible. So you want the courts to be non-corrupt, you want um, the legal system to be clear and transparent, and you want whatever uh, institutions are responsible for enforcing contracts or uh, limiting crime or limiting violence, you want those institutions to be functional. And so what the state capacity literature points out is that um, countries with higher quote unquote capacity, legal or fiscal, are better able at doing that. So it's better to be in a country like Switzerland or Norway where, where state capacity is high in public goods provision or uh, the court system or the legal system works better than in a country like um, Chad or Nigeria where it's less effective. Point, points taken, Mark, and I do agree with you to an extent, but Peter Leeson has a paper on, on, on anarchy and how to make it efficient. But this is my question. For anarchists, for, for anarcho-capitalism to work, we must be pro-social and economists are yet to tell us, how do we really get to Denmark? Yeah, so that's um, that's, uh, that's, that's a crucial point. The Pete Neeson also has a paper called about Somalia, which is called Better Off Stateless. And he has a book about um, about uh, how how anarchy can function. But even he makes doesn't make the claim that necessarily anarchy is better than, or will necessarily be better than the arrangement you have in, say, relatively developed countries. So he doesn't pull the trigger on anarchy in the US, for example. But he does make the, the more limited claim that potentially anarchy is better than a, the worst possible government. And um, in the extreme case, I don't disagree with that, that you could be, you know, it's better to be, it could be better to have no state than to have a totally uh, despotic, uh, evil, totalitarian state. Um, but it's in the middle, in these middle cases, then it seems like, it seems you still want to, you're still better off being in Denmark than in Somalia, right? So then it raises the question, how do you get to Denmark? And when you mentioned this idea of, um, of, um, of, of society, right? So civil society has been part of the, 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 um, the story as well, the story of development. And I think that that's the theme of the recent book by Asimov and Robinson, The Narrow Corridor. So this is the idea that you need state capacity potentially to ward off problems of violence and anarchy, but state capacity on its own could be you know, used for despotic purposes. So what constrains state capacity, what well, society, individuals who are able to organize um, and uh, limit the state or protest against the excesses of the state. So, yeah, I think that the, the way the literature is going is saying there's some potential for society, um, including civil, and I say freedom, individual freedom, and 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 state development to be complementary. There's some potential, and that's that's you know how that's countries 
as what Fukuyama means by Denmark, basically. But there's no guarantee you'll go you'll go along that narrow corridor. There's no guarantee you'll go along that path. So you could end up in a place like China where you have a powerful state, but a very weak civil society and limits very limited individual freedoms. Or you could be um, in, a society, in a place like these, for example, of Nigeria, where the state is weak, but there's an ongoing problem of endemic violence and corruption and so on. Nigeria was referred to as the poverty capital of, of the world. Yeah, and it's they, they, in a narrow corridor, which is this, as I said, recent book by S. Magnus Robinson. They use it as an example where, yeah, there's too little, in some sense, too little effective government, only. So the state is weak and, and civil society is weak as well. All right. So perhaps you, I can return maybe to the to the opening question about J Japan and China. Maybe I should should. Yes, that, that we're heading into that into this yeah. into this direction now. So you may continue. Yeah. So so one of the issues about um, sick pass is relevant for this this uh, um, divergence which we we see in, in in East Asia. So to kind of you know, reiterate to your listeners, the reason this is a puzzle is that if anything, I mean China was one of the great empires of world history. And um, even as late as, say, 1750, 1800, the Chinese empire is incredibly impressive, at least from the outside. It's, it's big, it's peaceful, um, it has property rights and kind of some level of market development, economic development. And obviously it has this great history of um, innovation and kind of literature and, and culture. Whereas Japan, less so in a sense, it was more feudal. Um, it was its culture was maybe you know at least historically more derivative uh, of the Chinese culture than vice versa, and so if anything, a lot of observers might imagine China to be the Asian superpower in, in the late nineteenth century, early twentieth century. But what you see is the opposite. And you see this divergence between um, Japan and China, with Japan becoming the first Asian country to industrialize. And then the, the question is, what explains this divergence? And was it how puzzling? How surprising was it basically? And um, State capacity is part of the answer to this question because it's undoubtedly directed from the top. Um, so the, the, the Japanese um, in the Meiji Restoration, they abolish a lot of restrictions on trade. So it's, it's good for markets in some sense. There's a historian, Pierre Vries, who describes the Meiji state as a quote unquote capitalist state, but it's definitely coming from above. It's enforced through the state, it's enforced using coercion. So things like they abolish for some the distinction between different classes. So the samurai caste are abolished. Uh, they lose their, their legal status and their privileges. Um, foreign trade is opened up. So Prior to a major restoration, foreign trade was illegal or only restricted with, um, you could only do trade, you could only trade with a very small number of merchants in Nagasaki who were Dutch, um, some Chinese, some Koreans, but with a major restoration, they have, they have more or less free trade. So we moved from more talking to free trade. And then internally, there were, there were tariffs and different currencies and different tax systems in each uh, province of Japan ruled, each province was independently ruled by a lord known as a daimyo. And that's, a, that's abolished. So you create a central market, central um, single legal system. So it's it's like a, a top-down opening up, if you like. Um, and it's it, it, there are many um, struggles and problems. There are rebellions. There's a lot of violence. There's a lot, there's, there are tax riots. A lot of people protest. I'm, I don't want to pretend this process was great for everybody. But in the long run, it's successful, like undoubtedly successful. And the contrast is with China, where there are um, some attempts to reform in the face of defeat by colonial powers. There's a so-called self-strengthening movement, but in general, they are unable to coordinate a nationwide set of market liberalizing uh, reforms, opening up their economy and transforming it and making it ready for uh, modern industry and modern development. So that, they, 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 that's, that process is unsuccessful. And as a result, the, the, the Qing dynasty collapses, the ruling dynasty of China collapses, and they enter a period of, kind of chaos and um, civil war, from which they're only really fully um, wrenched by, by um, um, uh, firstly, the end of the Republican period, but really by the communists in, in, in the 19, late, late 1940s, early 1950s. And then that, they then embark upon another disastrous uh, episode with command and controlled communism. So China only really emerges um, in the end of the 20th century after 1978 as, a, as an economic powerhouse. Exactly. So Fukuzawa Yukichi was very popular in Japan mm. and we credit him for the mother, we credit him with the modernization of Japan. But China had 
similar intellectuals, but mother, 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 modernization was never evident in China until recently. And this is a pressing question that we're yet to truly understand. Was it, I, I get your point, restate capacity, but was culture also equally important? Yeah, so certainly um, culture uh, 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 and um, so there are, there are liberal thinkers in, in both Japan and China. I actually just um, uh, reviewed a book which was about classical liberal ideas in China. Who wrote um, the book? Um, no, I have to find it's actually not yet published. So um, I can, uh, if I, uh, let me figure out who that was. Uh, it's, a, it's a project by a guy called Evan Osborne, but it's not yet out. Oh, I'm familiar with, with him. Okay, okay. yeah. Um, so, so um, what I would say, I don't have a great answer to that question. Well, I'll say two things, which is firstly, a general theme of my research and some arguments I've made um, in, other, in like my work on religion and, and toleration is, is not to downplay ideas per se, but to make the point that ideas uh, uh, have, to be, have to have a reception and that depends on the institutional environment. So having the ideas if there's no one receptive to them or if there's no market for them um, or no institutional framework to um, translate the ideas into policy means the, limits the ability of the ideas to have an impact. So um, if you think about the work of McCoskey, Deirdre McCoskey, who emphasizes ideas a lot, um, I don't per se disagree 100% with that, that with ideas, but where I disagree with with, with her books is her, the downplaying of institutions as being important. And my view is they're complementary. So you don't you need, you need both. And um, so to take, go back to the Japanese and Chinese example, the Japanese were culturally more receptive. Um, but why that is, is an ongoing, bit of an ongoing mystery. But there was also institutional support for, their, for this rece reception of Western ideas. So they, they, they had these missions to the West. They sent um, Japanese elites to Western universities. And so they had a you know, mission to the West where they would really observe what was going on in Western societies. And then when they were take when these ideas were taken back into Japan, they were incorporated, like they were adapted by the Japanese, which is something the Japanese have a um have historical ability to do. Whereas in China, that there was they were seen as more of a threat to the existing order. And yeah, again, there are various reasons for this. I don't want to say state capacity is the only factor going on here, but what I, what I would say is the Chinese are aware, certainly by the late 19th century, they're aware they're behind. They're aware that Westerners are ahead in science and technology, but they're not necessarily willing to pay the huge cost of revolutionizing their institutions until too late. So um, they are eventually willing to do so, but, but it, it takes like 30, 40 years later than Japan. So for example, the imperial examination system is this very important Chinese institution um, for selecting elites and sele selecting government officials, whereby there's a, it's an impartial meritocratic system, but you're, you're selected on the basis of your knowledge of old Chinese literature, uh, Confucian scholarship and so on. And so this knowledge is increasingly not useful for government governing by the late 19th century, early 20th century, but it takes until the early 20th century for this examination system to be abolished. So they are eventually able to reform, but they, they, they delay. And why do they delay? Well, they don't, yeah, I think the institutional story is an explanation for it. I also think one, one factor which is um, also relevant and it, which is institutional is the Chinese dynasty, the Qing uh, Manchus ethnically. And so they're reluctant, as, as ethnic Manchus, they're reluctant to, um, change things too much because they're sensitive to being accused of being foreigners um so they don't want to that that makes them reluctant to reform whereas in japan the the elite the elites who reform are from a samurai class and they're able to like you know almost turn on a coin in terms of switching from being samurai warriors to being industrialists um and maybe, maybe, maybe there's something special about the Japanese case that other countries couldn't have learned it. But I still think the comparison with China is instructive because it's such a stark comparison. Japan illustrates the paradox of isolation and appropriation. So, for example, during this period of isolation, the Japanese kept a close watch on the Dutch. So even yeah. though J Japan had little interest in trade, the Japanese were always interested in learning from other cultures. 
That's true. So the Dutch knowledge is so yeah, the Dutch learning is 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 so so yeah. There, there's some even in, during a period of isolation. There's some um, interest in Dutch medicine in particular. That's definitely true. And so so um, what I would say is two things. Especially the Chinese also learning from say the Jesuits at this period. Um, yeah. So so, but if some of the story might be a unique facets of Japanese culture, which enable them to adapt. So I don't want to rule that out of court, but I, I think the more interesting story is the institutional one, because if we think about other cultures or other countries, can they replicate the success of the Meiji Restoration? That might be easier to do if it's a question of institutional change, as opposed to like some unique feature of Japanese culture, which makes them assimilate new ideas and while making them Japanese, um, you know, which is, which is a plausible hypothesis as well. It is all about cost benefit analysis. So, for example, the Ottoman the, the Ottoman Empire promoted reform, but it was not as successful as Japan. So, Afner Griff actually has a paper on the topic with his co authors, and they argue that the response to productivity shocks is based on the cost benefit analysis. Yeah, I think so. That's if you're thinking about the decision elites are making in these societies, they, they, can, they can increase Western technology or Western institutions. And uh, but there's a there's a potential potential cost. If you just implement the technology, maybe the cost is low. But if you implement, say, change the education system, right? So you implement modern universities. Um, modern universities require free discourse and some some level of freedom of speech to function. You have to be able to criticize and to debate. And so um, some or authoritarian societies they want the technology, they, they want the guns, but are they willing to implement the free press or uh, and for the Ottomans, it's it's we eventually do so, but it's very costly. And if when they do so, there's a risk they'll um, generate enough opposition, they'll have a rebellion, a revolution, which is eventually what happens. Um, so yeah, for so all of these societies, who they they, they see event they, Russia's as another case, Russia, the Ottoman Empire, China, Japan, they see they've fallen behind the technological frontier. They see that militarily, they're not able to compete as they previously had done so. So they, they want to change things. They want to bring in military experts, the latest cannon, latest ships from the West, but, but they also want to build their own technologies. And so they have to change, their, revolutionize their societies. And there's always a cost to doing so. And yeah, that's why we delay in many cases. Um, the, the canonical example is the railroad. So the railroad is, is, is kind of not built. The late, King China builds very few railroads, whereas the Japanese build a lot. And one of the reasons why is in Qing China, they, they run into a local opposition from local elites and, and they, the, the state backs down to this local opposition. Yes, in, in the Ottoman Empire, religion provided legitimacy. Therefore, it made more sense to invest in military than to invest in the, pin, in the printing press. Doing so would, would have been infeasible because it would upend the authority of the, the, the Islam. Yeah, so that's that's Jared Rubin's kind of argument, and it's definitely yeah, and it, it's slightly early period, but it's definitely um, one of the reasons why they're, they're reluctant to 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 make that change. Yeah, for sure. And again, an another fascinating point, Mark. Did size affect the ability of the emperor to govern China? So yeah, so one of the main arguments we make in that paper with uh, it's with I should add my co is uh, Chiaki Moguchi and uh, Tonhui Seng. So one of the key key things we emphasize is the importance of geographical size in all um, pre-industrial societies. So before the telegraph or modern communication technology, um, the size of your country is really important for your ability to just govern. Um, the big countries tend to be you have to tend to be decentralized, and big countries tend to be empires as well. An observation made by Montesquieu, because if you have a, a parliament or a place where people come to meet to, to govern, like representative institutions like a parliament, um, you need to travel from your local place to the center to meet and to coordinate and, and so on. And in places like China, that's just infeasible. It's just too large. So the, the Chinese governance system tends to be a hub and spoke system. Uh, this is an insight um, Hilton Root, my colleague George Mason has made. So in China, there, there are strong connections between each local prefecture or in the province and the center, but very little um, communication or um, uh, contact between the different provinces, different areas of China, except through their link to the center. And so the Chinese state, it's it's so big that you can't really, you can't, 
you, you can't risk central, centralizing or building state capacity in the whole of the country is kind of unfeasible. And um, especially for, given, given the existing technology of governance. Whereas in a smaller country like Japan, it's actually easier to coordinate on a policy of, of, of economic reform. And it's just, it's once they centralize, they're able to, 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 to defend themselves because of their small compact size. In China, so the Chinese, I, I said they didn't modernize, right? So the, it's, if, when you look at the details, they do try to, they are self, they are, there's a self-strengthening movement and they do build to some degree a modern fleet actually, but they're not able to coordinate. Um, and so developments in one area are not matched by developments in, our, in other areas. And when they fight with Japanese in the war in, in 1896, it's partly because the Chinese fleets are regional, that they don't coordinate, uh, they don't have a coordinated defense program. So, um, what we're saying is reforming a very large territory is much harder than 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 reforming a small territory, and that that shapes why China struggles to implement modernization, and also potentially why Russia also struggles in the same kind of period, and also why the Ottoman Empire kind of struggles and eventually breaks up. Whereas if you're a smaller territory, you can more easily um you can uh, these policies are more easy to implement. Okay. And also, did tax policy impede the, 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 the development of China? This argument is intuited, is intuited in a paper published by Debin Ma titled State Capacity and Great Divergence, the case of Queen China, 1644 to 1911. Yeah, so the general, um, so this gets back to this kind of libertarian kind of um, a position we, we talked about at the beginning. And there's a, a lot of people have worked on this topic. There's a guy called Pierre Vries, as I said, my co-author, co uh, Tonhui Singh. Um, so the, basically, to give your listeners a broad idea, idea of the story, traditionally, the traditional image Western historians had of the Chinese empire was that it was a um, despotic empire, which taxed very heavily and property rights were secure and so on. And the, the more recent scholarship by all of the people just mentioned shows that actually, even if it was despotic in the sense of sort of highly autocratic empire, and you know people could be killed by the state pretty easily. The tax rates, at least the taxes collected by the central government, as opposed to things which may have been siphoned off by local elites, but central tax collection was very very weak. So the Chinese state collected a very small amount of, the G of GDP in taxation, small relative to any modern state and small relative to like European states. So in that sense, the Chinese state looks like a light touch state. Um, which you might think all else equal could be good because you're leaving more um, more ca more cash more money in the hands of a population who would best know how to spend it. Uh, but 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 it turns out this this whatever benefits this low tax equilibrium had it posed challenges. So for example, one of the major public goods provided in, in early modern China was granaries and also flood defenses. So the Yangtze and the Yellow River are very prone to flooding, and when they flood, it's very very damaging. And because of um, externalities, it's a collective action problem to, to, to build flood defenses. And so when the state was running out of revenue and it was weak, increasingly weak in the early 19th century, they didn't build enough flood defenses. So the China, so China's very, so there are a lot of floods basically, and a lot of people die and a lot of, um, there's a lot of destruction. Similarly, when, when you get struck by bad weather and you have a famine or, or local famine, has the state built enough granaries? And the Chinese state traditionally did build granaries, but by the early 19th century, these are in disrepair. And so, I mean, I mean, let alone when there's violent rebellions. So there are several violent rebellions in the early 19th century, culminating in the Taiping Rebellion, which is a civil war which kills many millions of people. And there's also a threat of foreign invasion. So the British invade parts of China during the Opium, Opium War. In 1839. So, in, in all that situation, all those scenarios, having a state which doesn't tax a lot and is hence is weak and cannot provide these basic public goods it isn't a great advantage. It's a big disadvantage in actual fact. So, a lot of these scholars have said, you know, China had a low tax equilibrium, um, which which was you know not necessarily a bad thing in the 18th century, but it means the state is unable to meet all these challenges in the 19th century. And so that's part of a story for why China's state weakness is seen as a contributing factor in the Great Divergence. And in your paper, you also 
point, pointed out that decentralization, in a sense, gave Japan the edge because historically Japan was a decentralized territory. Yeah. So, so the the, the Japanese um, is uh, it's a it's a it's a feudal society, and even after unification by by uh, Tokugawa Ieyasu, who's the sh- sh- become a shogun in the early seventeenth century, he um, allows the local lords, the daimyo, to rule themselves to some degree. And now this has costs. So as I mentioned, there are different currencies and different tax rates and internal tariffs. So you you lose some, you have some static costs in terms of trade, division of labor, Smithian uh, dynamics. But the benefits are that each of these local rulers actually provided a lot of public goods. So the Chinese, so the Japanese society is actually pretty well governed at the local level, law and order. It's it's peaceful. Um, like things like flood defenses, forest state, deforestation under control. Um, so there's a lot of local state capacity. Education rates are high. So these are some of the factors which, when you study them, make it less puzzling that Japan was successful after 1870. So local education is pretty good. Literacy rates are quite high. And so, yeah, the decentralization of the Japanese state turns out to be uh, an advantage. Yeah, One, even it allows them to centralize, if that makes sense. Yes, and then remember, Japan was like the grandmaster of isolation. The Japanese recognized that China was humiliated by the West and they did not want to succumb to defeat. So they had an incentive to reform. Second mover advantage. That's true. We have about 20 years, 20, 15, 20 years, yeah, after, afterwards. Um, but even, yeah, it's been a little bit of time edge on, on China in that respect. Um, but I think even so, other countries don't necessarily make use of that that advantage they had, but that's that's true. Yes, and and another fascinating point when we, we often discover when studying China is the role of the benevolent leader. So the leader has the mandate of heaven, taxes are low, and whenever the economy takes a downturn, it is assumed that the, the leader has lost the, the, mandate, the, the mandate of heaven. And this, play, this plays a role in the trajectory and development of, of China. So, for example, instead of assuming that the leader exists to serve us through constitutional reforms, for example, we tend to project re- religion and mysticism onto his, per, onto his persona. And whenever these mystical beliefs do not come to fruition, it can create calamities. Yeah, so there's an ideological basis to the, how the Chinese state is organized. Um, and so, yeah, that, which is, but, but uh, that, that potentially in a pre modern period is actually, you know, to the extent that they, that's believed, that's a potentially a good way to, to organize your society because the ruler has an incentive to maintain peace and to maintain good economic outcomes and conditions. But it means that when they have a series of negative shocks, that delegitimizes the ruler and leads to potential rebellions and, and chaos. Yes, so, uh, so, I, so, it, so I, I do believe in the power of religion to motivate people, but in this sense, it would make better sense for the, the law to provide legitimacy in, in contrast to religion. Yeah, so that's that's the, and that's the big contrast, I guess, between the Chinese Confucian um, tradition um, and or Confucian legalist tradition and the Western tradition. So the emperor is always it's like a font of the law, but he's always above the law. And the emperor and, and I say all officials always retain some discretion in the, the Confucian idea ideal is that the because the world is uncertain, there's always some um, you always need some room for discretion. So the rulers, both the emperor and I say all the lower down magistrates, should have discretion. And and that contrasts with the Western notion of putting the ruler under the law. Uh, that's another cultural difference which could have played play, could play a role in in this in this great not the divergence between Japan and China but the divergence between China and, and the West. Originally, in our discussion, you referred to institutions, and I'm going to rush 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 this point a bit. Europe created universities, and universities were autonomous. Fuku, Fukuzawa Yukichi actually said that the Japanese are not interested in debate, and he was the pioneer f- of the debating culture in Japan. Fukuzawa, Fukuzawa Yukichi also built a university, and the university was autonomous. So though China had institutions of higher learning, they were not structured like the Western University in the sense that the, the, 
the, the depart departments were not endowed with sufficient autonomy to conduct research that conflicted with society. So that's an edge for the institutional school. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, I mean, I think I think it's it's, it's right to say that the Japanese reformers like Fukuzawa Yukichi were were ahead. I mean, they they were more successful and maybe more radical than their equivalents in China, and maybe they understood the West and what the what gave the West. Uh, more deeply than did their equivalent reformers in China. That's that's possible, and yeah, those institutional changes were important for sure. And and, and again, Mark, we we discussed military and why leaders had, had an incentive to invest in military technology. But as Debin Ma points out, the Japanese also took the lead in terms of agriculture and agricultural technologies. Yeah, so. The Japanese are able to develop the silk industry and also textiles industry in the late 19th century and to, and to like in a, in a, even gain an edge over yeah, everyone else, um, whereas, whereas the trainees are not able to do so. Um, I'd have to, you, you have to remind me exactly. I know, Devin's, I know Devin's paper, it's a long time ago when I read it. it. It's a long to, time ago. I read it a long time ago too. <laughs> Um, so I can't, uh, the, 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 I, I know from other papers, like so, so those of the work of Bob Allen, the, 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 the story about the Japanese edge, I think in Syria culture and, and, and it's other areas, textiles, is that initially, initially the, um, the technologies are not that suitable for the conditions in Japan because the um, fact of, like, the, they're designed for areas where weight, labor is expensive and machinery is cheap. So um, uh, they're not, so the, the techn these technologies have to be adapted for Japanese conditions. So the Japanese are able to do so. And once they do so, they can be, be, be able to, uh, um, gain an edge and even kind of like in textiles that, um, uh, uh, um, overtake the UK eventually. Uh, this, the silk story, I remember it's a story of like innovate, local innovation and capital um, intensity tends increasing over time, but I can't remember the details. But certainly, yeah, the Japanese are able to do these local innovations which adapt the technology for their circumstances and then and then catch up. And other 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 Asian countries are not successful at doing so. so you, not just China, but also India, which is obviously under the British Empire. India remains specialized in agricultural exports, not in um, does it's not able to 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 really mechanize and industrialize. Uh, Mark. What, what's your commentary on the arguments expounded by some who contend that China could would not industrialize because the economy was already efficient, therefore there was never a, a need to implement labor-saving devices to increase output because the society was already in, in an equilibrium efficiency? It's a very old argument postulated by Elvin, but some people still take it seriously. I see. I, I mean, I, I think you have to restate it a little bit for me, but I, I know Elvin's case. It's like so. The, it's he calls it a low level equilibrium or low intensity equilibrium, something like that. Um, I mean, I think that's where the formal models are kind of helpful for like really making the, the terms uh, um, um, as precise as possible. Because um, yeah, I, I, it seems. So you can use the word equilibrium to describe like this the the the, the finding. Yeah, the high was, level equilibrium trap. That's what L Elvin. Yeah, high level, high level equilibrium trap. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. I I think here it's like you, to really make the argument rigorous, one needs such a mathematical model to, in my view, to really nail down what 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 what, what I take that argument to be. Is it's almost like a metaphor to say that. Um, the Chinese society was like economically developed, right? As Adam Smith noted, it was sophisticated. It was a market economy. It had like you know a lot of urbanization and so on. But it was it was not. It didn't look viable for any one set of entrepreneurs or innovators or emperors or magistrates or whatever to change it, reform it internally along along the lines of um, uh, in the way of the West uh, reform. So, but my my my. My real argument here is it's science which is missing. So I think I, I kind of really, I think the big, I think Joel McCare's work on the culture of growth and the culture oh, of science. Oh, Joel McCare, yes. Yeah, I think really that's one of the more insightful, most insightful uh, ways to think about the difference between China and Europe. So China's economy is fairly developed, but we don't have this culture of debate, of um, science of publishing research, of criticizing other people's research. And so um, that's the ultimate difference um, between the two societies.
and then <laughs> and then Europe had people like Isaac Newton and Francis Bacon and Francis Bacon especially averred that man had the opportunity to change the, the natural environment that line of philosophy did not take hold in China yeah yeah exactly and I I mean I think that the there was a view which is the the, the point in which um, China was most likely to really develop was actually in the um, Song Dynasty, so earlier. That was a point at which maybe there was more um, scientific thought or more urbanization, more industrialization. And the point at which we're comparing China, which is like, you know, 1800, it was already a fairly um, conservative society in many respects. And it was, you know, it was doing okay, but it wasn't likely to burst through to achieving modern economic growth. And the research of Jan Luten van Zanden is actually refuting early assumptions because people like Jan Luten van Zanden and Stephen Broadberry are saying that China was actually relatively inefficient when compared to the rest, to the West. Yeah, so um, to summarize, I think, the, 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 this, these debates, um, the traditional view, which is in say, the work of David Landers or earlier scholars, was to view China as very backwards compared to the West. And then the revisionist position was associated with um, so the so-called California School. So particularly Ken Pomerantz and Isabel Bin Wong and um, others and Jack Goldstone to a degree. And they said, no, actually it's later say 1750 or even eight, maybe 1800, China was comparable to Europe. And then the more, most recent scholarship, which has just been coming out in the last kind of 10, 15 years, Broadbury and co-authors, Van Zanden and co-authors, uh, Devin Mars contributed to this, people like that. They actually have found that um, on many margins, you know, that, that revisionist position cannot really be supported. China was behind, not by much, but it was behind and the trajectory was also quite different. So while, whereas Europe, uh, particularly Northwestern Europe, wages and per capita incomes were going up over time, in China they were stagnating or possibly declining. Exactly. And back to your earlier point about science, Christianity promotes a linear concept of time. And according to writers like Toby Huff, in China, there was never the concept of natural law. The Chinese believed in social cycle perspective. So society in the in the Western tradition is either progressive or regressive. It will not repeat itself. But the, but, but the contrast was true for China. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's a cultural story. I'm, I kind of, I, I guess, I mean, I'm, I'm vaguely familiar with your idea. Uh, so again, you have to assess how much you want to emphasize the cultural stories versus the institutional ones. So, but yeah, that's definitely an argument for why they would not uh, be as innovative and so on. But I think, yeah, I don't, I, I'm not sure how much I would want to emphasize any specific one of those, but that kind of point, because maybe had they had different institutions or different other, different developments, they may have changed that idea. The idea of linear time may have emerged. Uh, but yeah, there's definitely one claim for why there's a big cultural gap between West and East. I'm not sure, yeah, I don't know how much I personally believe that to be decisive. And surprisingly, even though some submit that China is propelling ahead of the West based on the data collated by the Center for, for Strategic and International Studies, China is actually a laggard in terms of technology. So 21st century China is, is well, to, it is a global power, but to what extent are the prospects for 21st century China viable? This is not necessarily a, 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 your expertise or yeah. a question that I'm requiring a direct yeah. answer for. I think there has been, I think I actually, so this is, this is always, there are two issues. One is like the fact that innovation on the frontier versus ability to catch up, right? And so a lot of people, a lot of economists would say like a lot of China's very, very rapid growth in the last 40 years has been driven by catch up growth. So you, ability to adapt new technologies from West and just do, build up capital invest, not to be on the frontier. And so I think it, it is true that um, um, uh, China's ability to be an innovator on the, front, quote, quote, on the frontier is not yet proven. I, I would be I'm cautious against people who say they can't do it because um, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure that there are some areas, for example, in e-commerce, where they've been relatively innovative, but it remains to be seen, is, is what, what I would say.
Well, when I listen to experts, I find it quite strange that they rarely mention legalism. China is still a rule by law state, not a rule of law state. Mm. So even though economic freedom is on the increase in China, the average person in China, according to a piece recently published by the Harvard Business Review, appreciates the government because the government has delivered the economic goodies. But on average, the Chinese still subscribe to legalism. Yeah, I mean, that's right. So yeah, but, which is, you know, from like legal positivism. So whatever the state does is, is, is right. And so um, if they crush entrepreneurship or innovators, then in the long run, it's not good for, for growth. But I, but I, I, I mean, I, I've, I'm kind of cautious about making predictions because I also think they're quite committed to science. Um, so these two things are intention and it remains unclear how, how they'll be worked out. But I, I'm def definitely... Um, pessimistic about recent developments in China and the Xi Jinping, which uh, indicate a, ret a return to a more autocratic society. And yeah, that would be you know, consistent with the legalist roots, and that would be less good, that would, that would be potentially harmful for innovation in the future. And then there's also the issue of the ascent of the ascent of princelings in, in China. So individuals from certain families are promoted to high levels in government and the private sector. And I'm not saying that they are not qualified, but cronyism appears to be a problem. But yeah. as a university student, we were asked to examine Plato's Republic. And my two examples uh, examples at the, at the time were China and Singapore. Mm because it appears that they're serious about training elites to rule us, if to, well, not to rule us, but to manage their people eventually. Yeah, yeah. And you're saying that's threatened by too much cronyism. Yes. But, but China is such an interesting case study in so many regards. So, for example, this is, this is an, an ancillary point, but Africans tend to appreciate China's influence in the region, and for obvious reasons, China has a non-interference stance. So, in order to access mm -hmm. investments from China, you do you do not need to comply with corporate change, govern governance no. mechanisms. So, today I actually did that. Well, I didn't do the interview today, but it was published today, and I referred to that point. The ch the Africans will always dislike European rule because it's more colonial. The Chinese are saying, we have $10 billion, you can access the funds without reducing corruption. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. So even if Africans are being exploited, it does not seem to be real exploitation because they are able to exercise agency. Quite, it quite. Seems a, it's a mutual win-win. It seems like a mutual win-win for many Afri African states, for sure. Um, yes, Ch China is really fascinating, but we cannot spend the entire day talking about China. So we're going to move on and discuss the Black Debt. So you 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 have a piece titled "The Economic Impact of the Black Debt," and your co-authors are Remy Jedwab, Noel Johnson, and Mark Koyama. Mark, yeah. the Black Debt initiated change in Europe, but my question is a bit interesting to an extent but i've always wondered did the black debt led to the imp to the empowerment of women by making female labor more attractive so that's one of the many changes associated with the black death in, in, in the literature so the black death kills at least 40 maybe even more 40 percent of the population there's a massive demographic shock which um which is you know you're changing the fact of proportions drastically in in many many economies so if you think about england though some of the story happens in northern france and also in spain in england land suddenly becomes abundant so before the black death the agriculture is arable so people are growing have some kind of grain mostly and that makes sense given you've got to feed a population of maybe five to six million people after the Black Death and the, the reoccurrence of the bubonic plague, population just continuously falls for about 100 years until it bottoms out at less than 2 million people, one and a half to 2 million people. And so land is now relatively abundant and you need far less grain to feed the population and the remaining people have higher incomes. So what happens is a lot of the land is given over to agriculture. And wheat farming, so arable agriculture, particularly wheat agriculture, is really based on... Um, I've just, sorry, I've got a, um, something just came up, got food delivered. <laughs> you may have to edit this out. Just let me just deal with it. Okay, I'll wait. Uh, 
Yeah, sorry. Uh, I'll just tell my wife to pick it up. Um, maybe I'll just pick it up. I'll just, if yeah, if you can pause the recording and just let me bring this up. Um, because I, the reason is it, it's just groceries and I don't want to um, want them to overheat in the, uh, it's hot here. Oh, okay, okay, all right. Uh, sorry, I didn't know when it was going to arrive. So just, yeah, I'll be back literally in one minute or two minutes. Okay. Well, since he is away, I guess I may talk a little about China. So Toby Hoff had an interesting book on Ch on the rise of science in Western society. I think you can go and read that book. David Landes has a book and several articles. So it would also be good to consult the work of David Landes and Ricardo Duchesne. I'm back, sorry. Yes, not a problem. I spoke to the audience when you were away. Uh, but, so you may continue your, your point about the yeah, black so the, debt. So black debt massively changes land use is, is the, the, the point I was making. Uh, the, um, the um, arable farming is replaced by pastoral farming in an area suitable for pastoral farming. Uh, incomes have gone up because of um, this is a Malthusian economy. So there's now more capital and labor per person. So wages have gone up, labor is scarce. Um, and um, so land use changes and the plant, Arable farming is often plow farming in Northern Europe, particularly. So you need a lot of body strength to do it. So men are men are more suited for plow agriculture, and so women tend to work at home or they they work in the house. Uh, so there's a strict gender division of labour. But when you switch to pastoral farming, um, sheep farming, looking after uh, cattle, uh, milking cattle, then actually um, women can do this as well. And so this change in in land use creates uh, opportunities for female labor. So that's one of many effects that the Black Death has. Yes, because labor became scarce, women were seen as more attractive. And another point, Mark, had it not been for the Black Death, would we be talking about the European marriage pattern? So this is actually a controversial, it's more controversial than you might think. So many scholars, so um, uh, Tina de Moore and uh, John Leighton van Zanden have a paper about the European marriage pattern, and also uh, Nico Pointland and Joachim Boff. So there are some very good papers about the European marriage pattern as, as emerging as a result of a Black Death or in the, in the wake of a Black Death. Um, so European marriage pattern being um, higher age of first marriage for women and a uh, high proportion of the population not marrying, not reproducing. So you, it gives rise to a lower pressure demographic equilibrium where population growth is slowed and um, uh, there's more investment maybe in, in the number and quantity of children, quality of children rather than the quantity of children. Um, the, some historians will say this existed before the Black Death. So there's some scholarship saying in England, many of these features of the European marriage pattern, as far as we can measure them, may have existed beforehand. But I don't think it matters because it's undoubtedly the case that the Black Death strengthens this tendency. The, 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 so it solidifies this tendency towards higher age of first marriage, smaller families, and um, some large proportion of the population not marrying. Well, I've read Jan Lutin van Zanden and his co-authors, and they actually responded to, to, to Sheila Ogilvy because she's a mm. critic of the European marriage yeah. pattern. But what, what, but what we must say is that the European marriage pattern is unique to Western Europe. This is not debatable anymore. And studies have been done by Europeans and non-Europeans. But what's 
not unique about the European marriage pattern is that late marriage was actually indicat indicative of working classes in England during the pre-industrial era. Cambridge published a paper on the topic titled Wretched Boys and Girls, something to that, to that effect. Yeah, so there's, a, there's definitely a transition towards late marriage, um, but uh, late marriage, which then breaks down actually with the Industrial Revolution. I think my response on on the top on the topic of the um uh, uh, of the of the EMP and it's actually something I'm I've written in a book which will come out next year with, with Jared Rubin on like an introductory book. Oh, to, are you uh, writing a book? Yeah, it's 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 going to be called um you know how we got rich how we got rich it's a it's like a, a survey of, of it's like an intro book about to economic history so it covers every, covers all these topics like industrial revolution uh, why Europe not China. Uh, you know all of the, all of the topics we're talking about now, the Black Death, um, and and our our take on that on this particular debate about the European marriage pattern is that um, the critique of it. So Ogilvy and 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 others criticise the importance of the European marriage pattern on the grounds that it was in place across Northern Europe, including places which were economically stagnant, like. Northern Germany, parts of Northern, Northern Germany. So the idea is that the European marriage pattern can be consistent with both economic stagnation and also with less rights for women, because women were kind of repressed um, in, in those parts of Germany. And I think the, the, the answer is just, it, it's, if you think it's important, it's maybe a, it's, it's a necessary but not sufficient condition. It, it, I mean, to the extent you think it's important. So the European marriage pattern did not guarantee the rise of Western Europe. That, that's what I would say. But it's, not, it's not sufficient to explain the Industrial Revolution or anything like that. But is it part of the story? Maybe. It's a partial explanation. Yeah, it's part of the story because it gives rise to higher incomes. It, it reduces the Malthusian pressures on a society, I think. So for example, if China had late marriages, I doubt that we would have rec recorded an industrial revolution in China because China had a clan-based economic and political system, whereas Europeans had the nuclear family. And in the nuclear family, children are not under the subject of traditional authority, so it's either for them to innovate. So it, 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 is, it is a broad combination of factors. Yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, it's a... Uh... Exactly. I, I, so, so it could be one contributory, contributory factor, but I don't think it's, it's necessarily decisive. That's right. But on average, Mark, was the Black debt an economic positive for Europe? Um, so there's a literature saying that it was. I think it's actually important to be careful. Um, it has a lot of effects. So, uh, so we, me, me, we're together with Noel Johnson and Remy Jebba. We've, we've done several papers on its economic impact. And so the first and foremost point is initially it's totally devastating so um and and, and naive kind of views well it, it raised incomes or raised wages that are kind of misleading in this respect so it's economically devastating in the years that it takes place and it's i mean the fact that it kills millions of people is itself that that means it's economically devastating so it's, it's a terrible dreadful event and whatever positive effects it has on certain parts of europe take decades or centuries to play out so it's not like you want to have an epidemic or to, to you know whatever silver lining there is the cloud is still kind of terrible so uh, but what what effects does the black death have well for people who survive do eventually get higher incomes it takes a long time actually for wages to really rise in real terms because there's also tons of inflation uh initially because it's a negative supply shock but but in the long run as I said, land is now much much more abundant per person. Capital is more abundant per person. So interest rates fall, rents fall, it, wages go up. Overall per capita income goes up. Urbanization rates grow up. Uh, cities return to being um, the size they were before the Black Death by about 1600. Um, so the economy that emerges after the Black Death is kind of different. It's more urban. It's got higher income per capita, and it's it's configured differently. So Northern Europe does better than Southern Europe. In 1300, all the most developed parts of Europe were in the south, in Italy, Southern France, Spain, and the center of European trade was really 
through Italy and the Mediterranean to the east to get spices from east via, via the Middle East. And by 1600, after the, all these effects have played out, things have changed. Now, the effect of the Black Death in shifting economic activity to the north is also um, confounded by the discovery of the, the Americas. And so the opening up of the Atlantic economy also benefits Northwest Europe. So those two things are difficult to separate, but, um, but, but that's, that's one set of factors. So urbanization goes up, per capita incomes are higher, and there's a real orientation towards the North. The other important factor I think is the demise of serfdom, at least in Northern Europe. So in 1300, uh, uh, at least 50% of Englishmen and women were serfs. And by 1450 or 1500, serfdom has all almost disappeared. So labor coercion goes away. And this reasoning is the same reasoning we've gone through. Basically the bargaining power of labor goes up because they're scarce. And so even though the Lords try to repress workers, they try to limit their mobility and they try to reinstate serfdom, but it actually collapses. Uh quite breathtaking but mark so i've been reading the literature on the black debt and i'm interested in the political implications of the black debt so what were the political implications of the disease and secondly how did it affect the dynamics of cities and a third and and, and a third question what was the relationship between the, the the city dynamics politics and the black debt in other words did the fact that the black debt changed the, the dynamics of cities affect politics. Yeah, so all of those things, I think I've alluded to some of them already. Um, so there's some, uh, uh, the, the, the cities on average recover within about 200 years, but, um, but the individual cities, some recover, some don't. Some boom, some collapse. So individually, the urban economy is kind of reconfigured to some degree. Cities like um, Hamburg rise, whereas there are cities like Montpellier in France, which relatively receded in importance. So the urban economy is, is shaken. And politically, um, there are also developments. These follow from what I've just said, actually. So the fact that, that workers are more powerful and the ability, power and ability is re relatively reduced has political implications, for sure. Um, not everywhere. So it depends on the existing institutional configuration. But in somewhere like Europe, uh, West Northwest Europe, like England, it does seem to strengthen the power of the so-called gentry, so the lower level uh, landowners and um, the or or some degree of the ordinary peasants. And that may, may, might be reflected in the rise of parliaments. Um, but the effect is heterogeneous. So it's not uniform across Europe. Um, yeah, yes. And, and so, so, for example, serfdom, it, it, the story about serfdom is different in Western Europe than it is in, in Eastern Europe. Um, so there are, the, so Black Death has these heterogeneous impacts is how I would phrase it. I don't think uh, a demographic shock that kills people is necessarily always going to be good or, 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 or um, always going to be bad for kind of institutional development. Uh, and actually, uh, yeah, I would, I would have to think carefully about what the precise mechanisms are. And you can look at previous uh, demogra uh, demographic shocks and they were, they were associated often with the collapse of large scale empires. So the bubonic plague that afflicted the, the Byzantine empire in the sixth century is associated with like the collapse of a lot of Byzantine power. Um, yes, Mark, I don't, maybe you studied this topic at some point and I don't know, but would you be willing to study the relationship between the exposure to the black debt and modern income today? I have not studied it. And I, I think um, the, the, the challenge with these persistent studies is that um, yeah, a lot of intermediate, in, intermediate, intervening events. Um, and so I don't know how much, and it, what I have seen, so I don't know how, what the relationship would be. There is actually a recent paper, I was just reminded by, by Jan Vogler and his co-author, published in World Politics. So he, they use the, What's they the name of the writer? What's his name? Yeah, yeah, Jan Vogler. Okay. Vogler. Um, yeah, I, I know his, like, yeah, I know his, I know him. He was, it was just, he used the same data, he used the data we collected on uh, mortality rates at the city level. And they argue that there is a link between German po political development through the intervening periods to the late 19th century. And so areas which were more affected by the Black Death, I think had more representation and more, they were more kind of quote unquote liberal or democratic in the 19th century. Um, so so there, is a, there are people tracing that type of link. Uh, or another link might be technology adoption. Areas affected differentially by the back death might have been more or less prone to adopt new technologies. 
Um, the main thing I would say though is the effects of the Black Death are going to work through other things like institutions. The dem I think the demographic effects of an event so long ago would be washed out by now. But if they persist, they're going to persist because they affected some institution or culture, which is which has then persisted. All right, Mark. Do you know why I really like these conversations? Because it's it's like an academic defending his PhD dissertation. On this show, we don't claim to know much about anything at all. We're speculative and we create an opportunity for bright people like yourself to do further research. Yeah, it's been fun. I've, yeah, I've yeah, we, 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 I, I like to ask questions. So I ask questions and you respond and I may or may not agree, but the discussions have been very good. It's just that, unfortunately, this type of discussion is not facilitated in the mainstream media or on Twitter. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I that's really that's don't. That's yeah, I really don't see the point of Twitter. But I'm going to ask you a question on the black debt, and then we're going to mention a quote you made on Twitter. Interesting point. Was the plague a great leveler? So this refers to the um, to the uh, uh, to the, uh, the phrase that James Walter Shadell, who's a yes. historian who wrote a book about plagues and shocks and, and, and inequality. And so his argument is that inequality is only really permanently or substantially lowered by um, by um, uh, 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 massive shocks like world wars or the things like the Black Death. And so the bottom line is the Black Death was a leveler, uh, wages eventually. I mean, so uh, as I, I think I've said, the initial response by many elites was to say, look, we're not going to pay workers more. Um, we're going to restrict, we're going to use the government to restrict market wages. But that breaks down because they can't really enforce it over time. And there's, some, there's the Peasant Rebellion, for example. So in the long run, or in the decade, decades after the Black Death, it is a leveler, undoubtedly. Um, across Europe, as far as we can tell. And there's a guy called Guido Arfani who's just written an article in the Journal of Economic Literature about this. I think that actually the, the literature on the, pay, the back death and inequality is forthcoming. So it's not yet available, but it, it'll be coming out in a few months. But, but um, his, his, his um, uh, studies have shown that not all plagues are leveling at all. So he found later plagues in Italy did not have that leveling effect. And really, because it depends on the initial institutions, uh, it depends on, on inheritance regimes and so on, whether or not you have a market economy or, or not. So, but in a market economy, um, if, 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 if the wage rate is one of the determining factors of inequality, then yeah, the, the, then if, if you allow the wage rate to rise and returns to capital or labor go down, then it will have a leveling effect. Um, but the Black Death had to be very big to have such leveling effect. It's not clear that any other pandemic has that effect. Any subsequent pandemic has that effect. All right. So now this is the Twitter question. Mark, would you watch a series chronicling the rise of the Axum Empire? On Twitter, you said you are tired of the same lame stories that portray Europeans, even though we're already familiar with those histories yeah, yeah. There, there are hundreds of uh there's so many cool stories in history and i mean you didn't have to you just use you know you don't have to be a scholar to discover them they're easy to find on wikipedia there's so many cool stories and it's a real shame they're not they're not they're not uh, uh studied some some are more niche interest than others so the aztec empire or, and you, you could do things about um all kinds of periods even in so english history for example has so many stories which are not really explored for example simon de montfort first parliament um there's no tv show about 1066 even it's kind of crazy yes. there's just so many shows and movies about the of uh, the tudors um and so yeah i mean you can just there's so many stories out there and i think for returns to an ambitious screenwriter or movie writer just there and there, it's a bit of a market failure which I, I mean, I can explain, it, I think, but why, why are there not more of these movies? I mean, for example, before Mel Gibson um, did Braveheart, no one had done a movie, I think, about William Wallace that I'm aware of. But now, like, of course, William Wallace has a movie. But there are loads of other stories of comparable interest to the William Wallace story, which could be as good movies, but they, they haven't been made, which is a, which is a shame. And I think it's, yeah. it must speak to the no, it, it, bad it, it, education of these screenwriters in Hollywood or the risk aversion of the producers, which is maybe more likely. No, but 
what what you're saying is conflicting with the present narrative. Every day we're treated with stories on black people and race and identity politics. Therefore, if blacks and other minority groups are so important, why not portray the Axum Empire? If women are important, why not tell the story of Emperor Justin and his wife? Mm, yeah, those are both great examples. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, so yeah. I so again identity politics just cannot make sense because when these yeah. individuals have the upper have the opportunity to educate they do not yeah. Just, yeah. I, I, yeah. even cat even catherine the great mm. yeah. they made a tv show of her i think but i've not seen it but uh, yeah but like, that's a, that would be a good one for 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 for, for a lot of good yeah exactly you don't have to just always be about elizabeth Catherine the Great would be good. And there are all kinds of other female rulers who are more obscure who would be good. Or why, uh, not, why not do a, a series on the warrior wo woman of the Daomi kingdom in Africa? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or the military woman in, in Norway in the 10th century? Yeah, I didn't even know about them. So. Yeah, like women yeah, were in the army in, in Norway in the 10th century. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so there, are of, there, are of, there are a lot of cool things they could, they could yeah. do and they, they don't. I, as I said, I don't know... It's a, I don't know if it's a problem of getting the producers to sign on. The way cinema works now, it's all for the, uh, you, know, you have to make a t huge amount, you have to sell it globally. So you have, you can't have a story which just speaks to us, to like one country's audience. It has to speak to everybody in the world. And I think that, that's why we end up with too many superhero movies. <laughs> but I don't understand why um, TV shows at least can't do these things. Yeah. But the, the, the Aksum was one of the great empire, yeah, uh, empire, yeah. empires of the ancient world. Yeah, so there's yeah. there's no excuse. It's inexcusable. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, but we're going we to could, talk. I was hoping some I was hoping some screenwriters would see my tweet and then I would uh, <laughs> no, commission I, me as a historical consultant. <laughs> yeah, that that would be would be good. And what and what movie w w would you write? Okay, that's you put me on a spot there. I gave a few examples in that particular tweet, but I, I think uh, I I I I I was uh, I'm a fan of uh, sword and sandal epics and stuff set in the Roman Empire. There's already okay. a lot of it, but I think uh, I was I was disappointed that people didn't follow up the success of Gladiator with many many more kind of movies like that. So I I I could uh, I would set I would like a script set in the late Roman Empire, either. Like some of the examples I gave were like, I don't know, Constantine and Diocletian or the Emperor Julian or... Um, or Nero, we, we, we haven't Empire. made a good movie on Nero in a long time. No, Quo Vadis is a classic, but yeah, not Yeah, in that. a long time. And then there's Empress yeah. Wu. Yeah, yeah. I would love to see a film on, a film on Empress Wu. Yeah. I think my impression is for Chinese and for South Koreans and to some degree for Japanese well, actually do this. So I think the Chinese do make a lot of historical dramas and they do explore different periods in their history because I think they're not ashamed about it. And they're not, I think they're more historically literate than people are in the West. Yes, yeah. you shouldn't be ashamed of your history. It's just a guide to the past. I'm yeah. sorry, a guide to the future. But we're going to move on and you will briefly comment on your piece, Jewish persecutions and weather shocks. Just talk about it briefly because we're wrapping up. Yeah, okay. So this was a, a paper I, I wrote with um, Noel Johnson and, and Warren Anderson on um, causes of pogroms in, um, in medieval and early modern Europe. And the basic idea there is to really identify causally the impact of income shocks on 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 on, on, on pogroms. So, um, so this uh, we capture some of our earlier discussion about culture versus institutions versus other factors. But if it, so, if you think about endemic anti-Semitism as a cause of of pogroms, you're you're not wrong, right? But that culture was there the whole time and it may have varied place to place to some degree but it's fairly kind of largely a constant so why are pogroms associated with particular episodes particular shocks and so one view is is there's um there's there, jews are made to be scapegoats for bad times so you know, the economy collapses um there's a famine you blame you blame outsiders you scapegoat jews in particular you know in, in medieval europe and so we we use reconstructed temperature data to measure the productivity of the, or the, the, the measure the conditions of the agrarian economy at the time. So climate scientists have done amazing work reconstructing at a finely granular level what the temperature would have been for a given year based on things like um, tree rings and pollen data. 
And so using that data, we have some idea that 1317 was colder than 1310, right? And worse for agricultural produ productivity and production. And so what we show is that the, when, when there were periods of colder weather, Jews were more likely to be persecuted. And the effect is pretty large. Uh, the baseline effect kind of, kind of increases by more than 50%. Um, and, and this is particularly exacerbated in places with weak states and places where the grain markets were underdeveloped. So, so local shocks mattered more for actual availability of food. And it's exacerbated for places with other indications of kind of long run anti-Semitic values. So I mean, I think that paper really speaks to kind of the conditions under which um, minority groups like Jews could achieve religious toleration in, in, um, in the Middle Ages. All right elegant analysis but unfortunately i have to tell you bye we're wrapping up so it was a pleasure to speak to you mark and i'm going to go away and 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 please send me your, your book the book that you're yeah. writing well, which yeah it's not, it's, it's, it, yeah i can send you some uh, it's not out till till 2022 but yeah all right then so bye okay yeah bye nice talking all right.